Welcome back to week five. In this segment, I will highlight the implications of the liability of intermediaries on the realization of the right to freedom of expression. I will focus in particular on the concept of censorship by proxy or the privatization of censorship through the role and the functions of intermediaries. What is the significance of these various liability regime for free speech? How may they interfere with the realization of my and your freedom of expression and information? These are the, the two questions I will try to answer in the remaining of that segment. Before doing so, let me make an important clarification. I will be talking here mostly about intermediaries being held potentially liable for content which under the domestic laws of a particular country has been deemed illegal. I will not talk, at least not uh, until the end of that sequence, about content which may violate the intermediary's own term and services, which they may decide to take down or not. This process, too, is the object of many debates, along with the role of intermediaries over content that is not illegal under the law of a country. But we will uh, highlight that particular function only toward the end of that segment. So what are the potential problems with the liability regime, particularly the strict liability and the notice and takedown regime for free speech. The first very practical, uh, almost humane problem is that intermediaries are overzealous in their regulatory role. You remember that I spoke about the difficulties in understanding the knowledge standard that is at the heart of both the strict uh, liability regime and the notice and take down. That means in practice that intermediaries are gonna regulate and censor far more content that they may otherwise have had to do. That issue is well captured by the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression who in a 2011 report wrote, given that intermediaries may still be held financially or in some cases criminally liable if they do not remove content upon receipt of notification by users regarding unlawful content, they are inclined to err on the side of safety by over-censoring potentially illegal content. This, of course, is having adverse impact on freedom of expression and information online. Under the notice and takedown models, as well as probably as well as under the strict scrutiny models, there have been repeated examples of social media, such as Facebook, removing content which had been flagged by their users because it amounted to, for instance, child pornography, or because it was defamatory, or because it violated copyright, while in fact the content in question may have been artistic or possibly offensive but not illegal, and there were no copyrights involved. This has become a very large issue both for content that is illegal under the uh, laws of a country but also for content that may go against the terms and services of um, intermediaries. A second and much larger issue with the liability of intermediaries is um, a very essential one. Should a private, for-profit, most of them, body with no public representation no formal public function be tasked with what is essentially an adjudication role. Isn't it a well-established principle that only judicial bodies should perform that task? 
ultimately, many of problematic content may require a delicate and difficult assessment and balancing of rights. Are intermediaries equipped to do so? You may recall that throughout the previous weeks, we have highlighted the difficulties that courts are facing in adjudicating over free speech issues. Can intermediaries just take over this function? And who within the intermediaries actually do it? Are we witnessing what has been denounced by many as censorship by proxy or the privatization of censorship with the state delegating to private actors the sensitive and important task of content regulation and content censorship. Eugenie Morozov, a well-known author who expresses deep skepticism about the democratic potential of internet, does think so. He wrote, for instance, and I quote, being able to force companies to police the web according to state-dictated guidelines, is a dream come true for any government. The company must bear all the cost. They must do all the work, absorb the uh, user's hire. Companies are also most likely to catch unruly content as they are more decentralized and know their own online communities better than the state censor." End of quote. A number of theorists, academics, and organizations are also denouncing the privatization of censorship responsibilities. Some countries have taken steps towards ensuring that intermediaries can act as censors, provided they have received a court order to remove content. A 2010 law in Chile, for instance, provide that intermediaries are not required to remove access to user-generated content that infringe copyright laws unless and until they are notified by a court order. In Brazil, the Marco Civil Law adopted in 2014 provide that internet service providers may only be held liable for failing to comply with a court order requiring them to take down or block access to third party content. Unfortunately, these remain the exception. Throughout the world, intermediaries remove, block or take down content without any court order. And evidence of this can be found in the transparency report issued by a number of intermediaries every six or 12 months since 2010. This transparency report present how many requests state officials have made to intermediaries to access users' data, to block illegal content, or to take illegal content down. The majority of governmental requests submitted by governments to social media are not backed by court order. For instance, Twitter reported that out of the 4,600 requests that it received between January and July 2015, only 486, or roughly 10.5%, were court ordered, while the rest came from government agencies such as the police and there were no judge involved. Looking at Turkey, there were 450 court orders for content removal and 1,761 requests from other government agencies. Twitter complied with 23% of all the requests. Looking at Google, from July 2009 to June 2015, Google has received 26,531 requests from government to remove content. Only 43% of all those requests were backed by a court order. 
these highlight um, the very big problem that we are facing as users of uh, information online, but also as simple citizens of a national country. Our content may be removed by an entity such as an intermediary upon request from a government agency, but without any judicial and due process involved. That raises many questions, indeed many challenges, from a human rights protection standpoint. Thirdly, the transparency reports that I have um, presented are also not very transparent. For instance, they do not include data taken down by intermediaries on their own without a demand by a government entity. Such takedown are never the object of a court order. They are usually prompted by users complaining about specific content, alleging that the content may be violating the law, but most of the time that it is violating the intermediary's so-called term and services. What is meant there is basically the contract that the users in and the intermediaries have over the nature of the content. Such content regulation, or indeed censorship, is occurring without any due process and largely secretly, since social media are yet to publish any data about content taken down by and through their own internal processes and requests and requirements, as opposed to those prompted by a government demand. Such an implication is not directly related to the liability regime of intermediaries, but to the privatization of a public space for communication, governed not by the national laws adopted by Parliament, but by the rules and regulation drafted and developed by the private companies themselves, providing those services. To give a personal example, when I was the executive director of Article 19, which is a freedom of expression organization, Facebook removed the content of our um, Facebook page. It was a post related to a newly released Human Rights Watch report concerning torture in Syria. So Facebook did not notify us before removing the content, did not explain that someone had complained about the content, it did not tell us why the content was, was removed, and of course it did not tell us who asked for that content to be removed. That's fair enough. We don't need to know who removed it, but we needed to know that somebody had asked for that content to be removed, and we needed to know what kind of decisions had been made and on which ground. We ultimately found out that um, Facebook had removed the content because journalists from The Guardian, the British newspaper, got involved and uh, approached Facebook. We, on our own, could not, them, could not get them to explain to us why they had removed the content on such a crucial um, public interest issue as torture in Syria. This is an illustration of the many problems raised by the regulation that intermediaries impose on their content without any reference to the national and domestic laws. These are regulations that are prompted by the intermediary's own sense of what is and is not appropriate. It fails the process and the approach fail to meet the basic standard of justice that many, at least in established democracies, have come to expect from a quasi-judicial process. Some would argue that intermediaries, I pri as private company, should be able to restrict content which they feel violate their own terms of services without to account for their decision. It is, after all, their companies, their platform, their services, and thus their rules. This approach is problematic for a range of reasons, and I will just highlight two here. The first 
is the ubiquitous nature of the services that they are providing. Most of these companies have a de facto monopoly position on the communication market. With this monopoly position come, in my view and in the view of many others, additional responsibilities which may be more akin to the responsibility of a public entity or at least to the responsibility of an entity providing public interest function. In those conditions, they do need to fulfill some basic principles as far as the regulation of their content is concerned, of our content, as a matter of fact. The second uh, problem with the uh, censorship is that the company's rules, the company's terms and services, are the product of cultural norms which are essentially American. We're talking mostly about American companies, while those companies operate globally. This may not always make for a very good partnership. On the other hand, of course, one may be careful not to cry wolf too loudly and lament cultural imperialism too quickly. From a freedom of expression standpoint, and indeed from a human rights standpoint, as problematic as some of those terms and services and cultural norms may be, they are probably not as problematic as those that we may find under the various domestic laws of those countries, all of which may be directly violating international standards. Furthermore, in my opinion, there is a de facto system which may not be working so badly in terms of negotiating the local implementation of these private rules, American, most of them. I have highlighted um, the role of the courts and of tribunals more generally in dealing with a range of issues related to freedom of expression, including freedom of expression online. So some of these um, rules enacted by the intermediaries themselves and their implementation may be the object of an, of an adjudication by a tribunal. Um, this allows for the local ownership over the intermediary's rule. Note, though, that we do not necessarily find the outcome of that process particularly good for freedom of expression. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's important to recognize that um, those companies are operating within a system where the national tribunals and judges do play a role, and that role do include reviewing and assessing those terms of services and these rules. The second actor that play a very important role in the localization of those uh, rules and terms of services are the users themselves. They are the one who flag problematic content. They are the one who raise concerns regarding content produced by other users, which they think violate the rules of the platform. They are de facto negotiating and giving local meaning to the rules imported from a different context and a different country and cultural setting. This is not a perfect system, of course, but then again, the alternatives, in my view, are much worse. This is why many civil society uh, organizations and experts have been highlighting the problems with the privatization of the censorship and with the um, role played by intermediaries in regulating content according to their own terms of services. But we have focused far more on due process rather than the, on the nature of the rules and the identity of the actors involved. By due process, is meant a process which as the minimum implies or includes the following. First of all, all users should have easy access to and knowledge of the terms of services and the rules that govern the content regulation. It's very much uh, similar to the legality issue. 
as a, as a person using those services, you should be able to know fairly easily and quickly what is acceptable or not under the terms of services. The second principle is the transparency of the process itself. And that applies both to um, censorship required by government or indeed regulation driven by the terms of services of the intermediaries themselves. We should be able to know as users what kind of process is being uh, established, implemented, and what are the various stage of that process. The third uh, component or principle behind your process is that there should be an appeal. People whose content has been taken down should be able to appeal that decision and they should be able to have access to a process that allows them to appeal that decisions without going to a court of law, but internally within the intermediaries terms uh, of services, there needs to be an appeal system accessible to users. And the fourth principle is that there should be regular report on the content taken down by intermediaries on the basis of the implementation of their terms of services. That is not happening. Intermediaries are providing regular reports on content censorship as per the demands of government. They are not telling us which content has been taken down as per the demands of their own terms of services, even though that particular forms of regulation or indeed censorship is far larger than the one prompted by governmental request. To sum up, I have highlighted in this segment some of the implications of the liability regime and more generally of the role of intermediaries for freedom of expression. These include the temptation on the part of intermediaries to err on the side of caution and to over-censor, that is to censor far more content that may be required legally by government. Two, the privatization of the censorship function. And the third problem is the absence of due process over the uh, censorship or regulation of content that is being uh, done by the intermediaries. These problems come in addition to the imposition of the intermediaries on cultural rules and norms and a possible form of cultural imperialism according to some authors, also, as I have highlighted, um, this is highly mitigated in the online community and in the online world. In the next segment, we will turn our attention to a different challenge raised by the online system of information, that of the meaning of journalism in the digital age. Thank you very much. See you next time.